Hello and welcome to The Hard Questions. I'm Solomon Serwanja. On the 27th of November 2016, a joint security force attacked the palace of Omusinga Charles Wesley Mumbe of the Renzuru Kingdom, killing over 100 people. The army said that that attack was justified. In fact, there were allegations that the king was leading a team in subversive activities. To date, there has not been any form of accountability for the over 100 people who lost their lives. And yet, the government insists that they had to step in to stop what could even have been an overthrow of the state. Consequently, over 130 people were arrested and charges of terrorism, murder, and um, treason were opened against them. Later on, the government lost interest in the case and Omsinga Warenzuru was left to go back to his palace after signing a couple of documents that to some extent people said were confirmation that he was guilty for the charges and asked for forgiveness of that. But let's just walk back in time and try to build the scenario of what happened. Here is Lieutenant General Erelu speaking about that attack. At the time, he was commanding the second division of the UPDF forces. Take a listen to General Erelu. There was no child in that camp. There was no child there. Mumbere got to know that we are going to attack him on Friday. Mumbere sent his wife on Saturday the 26th in the morning. That's when he sent his wife with his children and they all left. With including all his property. In Mumbere's house there was nothing. He was only remaining with one trouser and one shirt. So they already had the territory. They had the, their flags placed everywhere. They had an army. They had an anthem. They had a currency. They had a map for their country. A team of five members of parliament, among other civil society organizations, petitioned the International Criminal Court to open charges against government of Uganda for acts of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Unfortunately, though, the ICC in their statement said, and I quote, the alleged conduct did not satisfy the contextual elements of the crimes of genocide under Article 6 of the statute. However, it concluded that there were acts of murder that were committed by government and that in-country measures should be considered to bring those to account. General Relu vehemently disagrees with the politicians. Take a listen. So for somebody to say that we kill the civilians, that person is not serious. Actually, those ones who are saying so are the ones who must go to the ICC because they are responsible for whatever was happening in, in, in Rezori. They know it, they planned it, they financed it. All these politicians saw whatever was, they saw the things building up. And yet everything was in their hands. If they were really patriots, if they loved the people of Kasese, they should have stopped this. These MPs should have stopped this. The fact that they failed to stop it, they must get out of parliament. They should just resign and allow other people to take over. Because they betrayed the people of Kasese and Renzori. They saw this coming. They saw, they saw it building up. They all knew about it. But they accepted it to reach the culmination point. And it is done. Finished. What are they talking about? So actually, the people who should take responsibilities are the politicians from Kasese, especially those opposition politicians led by their leader of opposition. One of those politicians is the former leader of opposition and member of parliament for Kasese district. The Honorable Winnie Kaiser joins us on the show today to try to walk back in time and remember the Kasese massacre and try to reconstruct what happened so that we have a sense of closure for the people who lost their lives. Honorable Winnie Kiza, welcome to the program and it's good to have you. Thank you, Solomon. It's so sad to walk back in time. 
remembering those moments when our people were killed in broad daylight by a government that was supposed to secure their protection, a government that was supposed to protect and defend them because that is solely the work of the UPDF and the police forces. So sad, over 150 people were killed, including women and children. The army distanced itself away that there were no women or children who were killed. If they managed to arrest others, other women, how would they then say there were no women killed? How do they say there were no women killed, and that there were no children killed, when they are women and men at the palace? Let's it's try, a lie. Let's try to build this, um, this story, really, from where it started from, for my audience that perhaps may not uh, be very knowledgeable about this incident. What was the build-up to this attack? What do you remember? You were a son of the soil in Kasese. You were a member of parliament for the entire district. You have been born and bred in Kasese. You know it at the back of your palms. What was the build-up to this attack? What do you remember? Perhaps it's good that we start there. Well, I can say for a fact that when government decided to open up space for cultural institutions in the constitution of 1995. Renzururu Kingdom was among those that also sought recognition as a cultural institution. And when Renzururu Kingdom wanted to, of course there were those who were for the recognition of the cultural institution and those who were against. There were some politicians from the kingdom who said it was not necessary to have uh, Renzururu recognized as a cultural institution. And of course, there were those who were saying it is a must for purposes of uh, having a cultural identity. We needed the institution recognized. So it took us a while fighting for the recognition to begin with, even when it was a provision in the constitution, 100 and, is it 126? Yes, I think it is Article 126, yeah, that talks about cultural institutions. It took us a while. Studies were commissioned as to whether the people really needed a cultural institution. I remember the one of Mugano Kajura. There were those reports by uh, uh, Kaba, Kaban, Kaban Aniche from Makerere University. Then we have many studies that were commissioned. Mm -hmm. And the studies were saying, no, the institution is a popular issue. The people believe in the cultural institution. And they all believe that Charles Wesley Mumbere is the king. So when it took us that time, some of the politicians again came up with accusations against the Mumbere, that Mumbere was behind uh, the Nalu. And those issues were sorted. It, it was a hassle. I can say that is the genesis. Now, when eventually in 2007, the cultural institution was recognized, there were people who were not happy that the cultural institution was recognized. They kept bringing in undertones of, you know, the king is a political king. You know, the king will come in with the issues of politics. We wouldn't have loved to have a cultural institution recognized. Nevertheless, the cultural institution was recognized and we went ahead with the activities of the cultural institution. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to this particular moment, the government or President Museven would have loved, just like they did in 2011, wanted the cultural institution to support the government. And the issue then was that the king and his institution should say thank you to President Museven. For returning the kingdom. Yes, for returning the kingdom, for recognizing the cultural leader, and therefore they should say thank you and they should vote for President Museveni. Remember, in 2001, Dr. Kizabesije challenged President Museveni and Kasese gave him a good vote. In 2006, when we went into multi-party dispensation, still Dr. Besije won Kasese, and that is how some of us came into parliament as members of the FDC. 
Now, in 2011, after the king had been recognized, the issue was you, the Bakonzo people, should appreciate President Museveni. You should appreciate President Museveni. So somehow, President Museveni gained some votes in Kasese. Now, by 2016, the situation was different. There were so many things that the people of Kasese still needed sorted, which the government of President M7 had not sorted. And eventually, the district voted for blue. Now, some of us who have been in the politics of Kasese know for a fact that the killing of the people was just targeted specifically to humiliate the king and the tribe for voting against President Museven. You are seeing this happen in Kampala. When the people of Kampala in 2020 decided to vote against President Museven, the same measure that was deployed in Katsese came here in 2020. Remember in 2008, when Uganda seemingly seemed to be away from President Museven, People were killed at the palace. So to us, we do believe that the attack was just because the people of Kasese did not vote for President M7. That's why his army went to attack a full palace. And an attack on the palace to us, we took it to mean that it was a tribe being targeted. And that's why some of us rushed to the ICC and asked that this issue be categorized under the genocide law. We'll get there a little bit. Yes. General Erelu said that the king was mobilizing militias under the names Chirumira Mutima and they were being trained and that when they went into the palace they found pangas and this group was in the process of attempting to overthrow government. In fact, he says that you had, they had even come up with their national flag, they had come up with the currency. There was some subversive activities that were happening in Kasese, and that the, gov the, the government and the army needed to come in to stop these subversive activities. Solomon, the kingdom has a flag, a flag that flies on all sub-counties of the district and all areas where people in those particular areas believe in the cultural institution. I've seen these flags of other kingdoms, including the one of Buganda, flying in so many sub-counties of Buganda. The cultural institution, the kingdom, has a national, has a, 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 a kingdom anthem, which we sing as a people. So when someone comes up to say they had a national anthem, they had a flag, as if it was something new, I really shudder and ask whether this person lives in Uganda or not. Even the Adola has a, a, a flag. So which cultural institution doesn't have a flag that identifies it? If a political party can have a flag, how about a cultural institution? So the flag is for a fact, yes, we have it. And it is a flag of the cultural institution. The anthem, yes, we have it. It is an anthem of the cultural institution. As to how Eruero decides to conveniently turn those as national anthems and national flags, I can't understand it. The currency that Eruero talks about is a currency that I, I personally don't know. I only saw it in the papers when someone said this was the currency of the Renzururu kingdom, but Renzururu kingdom had never come up with any currency. How would we have traded in currencies when we don't have our own bank? You see, those are issues that you can ask. How come that the currency issue came after the attack? How come that the map issue came after the attack? So after they killed the people in hundreds, they felt guilty. But because there was a lot of impunity, which impunity still exists even up to now, there is no way they could have answered questions regarding the killing. 
How do you kill over, two, over 150 people who are just in an enclosed place? And you think you will go away with it? I'm very sure wherever they are, they are still tormented by the spirits of those people. They must be haunted by the action they did. Otherwise, there was no currency. There was no map. Yes, the flag is there of Renzururu Kingdom. Yes, the anthem is there of Renzururu Kingdom. And we sing it on functions. The flag is always raised on functions. Even now, I have the, the flag in my house as a believer of the Renzururu Kingdom. Honorable Winikiza, the attack on the palace was the climax of it all. Yes. But there were a number of events that came before the attack including the attack on the prime minister's office yeah. where eight guards were killed. And there were several attacks that were meted against security forces by the people of, Renzori, of, of Renzuru, killing different police officers in different police posts. Yes. General Reru, in, in his submission, he presented that Chirumina Mutima, a rebel group that was working under the Omusinga, had even trained in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They were continuing training and they had intentions of subversive activities. And on that fateful day, the army had to move in. But before we get to that, kindly walk us back in time. What do you recollect? What did you gather to, before the climax of the attack on the 27th? Of November. Maybe let me go back to the Kirumira Mutima issue. We have one of our super journalists in the district called the Tembo Kahungu Misaire. Actually, Kahungu Misaire is the one who came up with the issue of uh, the Kirumira Mutima. When they were talking about the terrorists in general, when they would say terrorists have attacked people. And to us among the Bakons, I think we didn't have something for which to let the Mukonzo person know the name terrorist in Rukonzo. So Kawungu used an analogy that for a someone to get into killing someone must be someone who is hard hearted. So the name Chirumira Mutima was a Kaihura issue. It is Kaihura who first surprised us with a group called Chirumira Mutima. As for me, I had no idea as a leader in the area and in the Renzori region. The Chirumira Mutima aspect came in in 2014 when there was an attack in Ibundibujo in 2014. So Kaihura said, we have found youth who call themselves Chirumira Mutima, that they are the ones who attacked the palace. But this being a new nomenclature in the vocabulary of the Bakonzo, I think everybody felt so excited about the word. Now, how they coined it to mean an army of Charles Wesley Mumbere, an army that some of us don't know about, is something I don't know. Two, the royal guards that were guarding at the palace were trained by Kaihura after the kingdom had been recognized in 2008. General Kaihura went there and commissioned a training of the forces in a defensive operations. And according to him, he said, because government was going to offer security to the king, they needed to have them trained. And so they told the king, bring some of the royal guards and we train them. So if there was anybody training the army, then it should have been government. Because it is government that trained the first batch of guards who were guarding the king. And it was these guards who were in charge. Now, the other unfortunate bit is that these guards were not on anyone's payroll. They were actually volunteers. They would do this work in turns. They were drawn from the different sub-counties of the district to come and guard, and for them they would find it prestigious to be called guards of the king working at the palace. One of the biggest services they would offer to show their loyalty to the king was to act as royal guards. That's why you will find me even myself telling myself that I'm a royal guard because I'm under duty to protect my king where I need be. So actually, if it was, if I had the time at that time, I would also have gone for the Kaihura trainings 
not that I want to take over government by force, no. But I would know that the only way I can show royal, royalty to my king would be to stand there as a guard and ensure that he's protected and he's well taken care of. So many people showed up to get the training by Kaihura. So if there is anybody who trained Chiromiramutima was government of Uganda, if that is the army they were referring to, through the IGP, they trained them, told them what to do in case of any attack, and they were prepared. However, that is not what happened. Because prior to the attack, there is a young man called Kapilongo who was recruiting people, told them that government had wanted to appreciate the fighters of Renzururu Kingdom, the veterans, and said there was a package which government was preparing for the, the, the veterans. They would give you 40 pieces of Mabati, a motorcycle, and then two million to enable them to go and start life because they know that they did a good job. Remember some of these uh, veterans, by the way, the ones who assisted him seven in his fights when he was in the Renzoris. So there is a lot that happened for which we really feel so saddened that government did not do the job as it was supposed to do it. Government was supposed to ensure that we are protected. But this young man, Kapilongo, who was recruiting people, was telling them that he's doing work on behalf of State House. He was even giving them money, an allowance, sitting allowance, 10,000, 20,000, the ones he just passes by, gives 5,000. And he tells them, this is money from State House. We are collecting your data. We are collecting your records. So these people knew that they were dealing with an agent of State House. State House wanted to appreciate them for a good job well done. Now that they have recognized the Renzuru Kingdom, the fighters who fought with uh, the first king, Isaiah Muchirania, needed to be recognized for a job well done. And so the issue was that if your father was a fighter and your father passed on, the family can nominate someone to come and take on the benefits of the father mm -hmm. or a grandchild. So along the way, Kapilongo said, no, the only qualification you need to have is to just prove that you are a child of a former fighter. So he recruited many people, and Kapilongo himself called these people to the palace on Friday. That is before the that attack is before that happened the on Saturday. That happened on Saturday, telling them that they were going to have a meeting with officials from government on Saturday. And so there would be a bigger meeting on Sunday where the items would be passed out to the people. Mm -hmm. So people started coming in big numbers, coming to the palace to have a final briefing, to meet the people who were coming from government, to tell them about how they were going to receive the Yakasim. This being a government of handouts, the people rushed and knew it was a, a sure deal. Now people come. After arriving in the palace, they are told, you are not supposed to go back until these people come to address you. Remember, the issue was arrive on Friday, we give you final instructions, and then on Saturday, you meet the officials from Kampala who are coming to prepare you to receive. They knew they would go back, but they told them as long as you have arrived here, you are not leaving. Now, on, in the morning of Saturday, that is when the, the, the Prime Minister's office was attacked by soldiers. They killed their six people. So the message went to the villages that the soldiers had killed the king. That was the message that went to the villages. That is how some of the royal people to Renzururu Kingdom started attacking police stations that were closer to them. How could government kill our king? Until when they were told, no, it wasn't the king. It is actually the prime minister's office that was attacked. Now, before that, we had been told that government wants to have a meeting with the king together with the leaders. And this meeting was scheduled for Sunday. So myself and my colleagues, the members of parliament, we moved from here on a Sunday morning to go and, att go and attend a meeting that was happening at the palace, only to get a shock of our life. Saturday before the meeting, an attack happens, 
And then we call the king. Is the meeting still happening? The king says yes. Government is still insisting that we meet. Now, what about the attack? He says, well, I think that will be some of the issues that we shall talk about. So we travel on a Sunday to go and attend a meeting that is harmonizing the, the relationship between government. And I can say that the relationship between government and Renzururu Kingdom had become sour after the elections. To the extent that when the president was invited to go and be the chief guest at the coronation ceremony, which happens on the 19th of October, he never went. He sent the, hon the Honorable Ephraim Kamuntu. He's the one who represented him. He never went. Even on that ceremony, he said security should not guard the king. I remember the royal guards taking charge of the security at the function. And possibly the, the security that I had as leader of the opposition also had to be present because for them they were not under the command of the DPC of Kasese. That is when we knew that the relationships between the government of Uganda and the relationship with the cultural institution was not getting well. Mm -hmm. When they decided, no, we are not giving security to the, to the function, and remember, people are gathered there in thousands. So even if government was annoyed with the king, I don't see the reason why they should have even gotten annoyed with their own people to the extent that they say we are not offering security. Mm -hmm. So the royal guards took charge, and by God's grace, the function ended well. Remember, this is happening on the 19th of uh, October, and the attack happens of the palace on the 27th November. of November. Just barely a month later. After. So the anger by government was building. But I can also say that politicians of the NRM who lost we are all attributing their loss to the cultural leader. That the cultural leader is the one who told his uh, subjects not to vote for Museveni. You know, Vesija went there to the, to, the, to the kingdom and asked for the, the cultural leader's support. But from 2011, Vesija had always gone to the, to the institution, even before the king was recognized. Every time he would go to Kasese, he would make it a point to visit the cultural leader because of his relationship with the uh, priest, Christopher Chibanzang. He became a family friend. And I still remember even on the, on the day of recognition, by the way, security didn't want Vesija to come. And yet Vesija had been invited by the king himself. They stopped him from attending and he entered later after the president had entered the, 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 the ground, it also became an issue in the security quarters. To some of us who were with Dr. Vesige, the issue was that we just wanted to belittle the president because, of course, Vesige was highly welcomed, much more than the president. So to them, they thought it was an issue of sabotage, it was an issue of indiscipline. We said, well, it wasn't our fault, it was your security that stopped Vesige from entering until we showed them the card that this was a guest of his majesty. He's not coming here on President Museveni's invitation. But the owner of the function is the one who invited him. So the matter of the attack, to us, we believe it was political. And it was an issue to attack the tribe of the Bakonzo. We shall never move away from that. Because when you attack a full kingdom, you are attacking the tribe. And it was organized by government. Because that Kapilongo that I talked about, later after the attack, he went to President Museven and claimed with some other elders, claimed that they were the ones who arranged and trained, equipped the royal guards to attack government. Surprisingly, while other people were arrested, the ones who pleaded guilty and said they were in charge of the whole arrangement of the royal guards attacking and training, we are not attacked. We are not attacked. They were not arrested. Instead, they were given money. They were given cars. They started businesses for them. So, what business did President Museven have with these people who had trained, armed, equipped the royal guards to attack government? To the extent that he had to even give them cars, gave them state protection, hired for them houses, and they started living large. 
opened for them shops. The ones they trained were in jail. Others had been killed. Like I said, this man, to the people he was mobilizing, he was giving them an allowance, saying the allowance was coming from state house. Unfortunately, the debts he mentioned for giving out the properties was the same debt government attacked. And these people had been called into the palace. Remember us, the leaders, we had also been told there was going to be a meeting. We set off from Kampala to attend a meeting. As we reached Hima, the palace was, was burning in flames. So possibly the intention was to even have the leaders in the palace by the time they attack, so that we all die there. So it is unfortunate that a whole government can sit to conspire against its own people. And that is something that hurts me. That a government which is supposed to protect and defend the citizens with their property is the same that launches an attack, kills and inhales the whole tribe. It is so unfortunate and so disheartening. What did so you, when what? Elweru yeah. stands up to say, you know, he even says, for him he was even happy that he did the job. He says, I take full responsibility. I take full responsibility. He takes full responsibility of killing people. And that is the reason we went to the ICC, thinking that these are crimes against humanity, which the ICC should find within and within its uh, control. It's unfortunate that after we had taken our case to the ICC, the prosecutor was seen in Rwachitura grazing cows with the President Museven, and we said, my God, how do I take my case before you? And you are there with the perpetrator, you are there with the person, the accused, you are having fun. So I, at the beginning, we didn't really, when the, the ruling came out, one, there was a heavy campaign by President Museven, referring to uh, our people as terrorists, and remember, the cases against them were terrorism, robbery, murder, treason. Among the many cases, they had a whole list of around 40-something cases against, preferred against them. But something that should be of interest to the listeners is that there were no proceedings. For seven years, our people were in jail. They had never been heard. They would only appear in court for mention. What we only had was that, you know, at the last time when we thought government was coming up with evidence against them, then they told us we have taken the matter to the high court that is supposed to hear such a cases. The lower court cannot listen to this case. So we have gone to the high court. That's where the issues will be heard from. A date was even, was even mentioned for the hearing that on such and such a date, the hearings are commencing. The lawyer said, okay, furnish us with the evidence that you have. That is what the law says. Can you furnish us with the evidence that you have so that we can prepare our defense? No evidence came forth until seven years. By the end of the seven years, other royal guards had started dying in jail. Actually, 11 of them died there. Remember, these people were tortured. These people were beaten. These people survived bullets. These people were picked from the smoke. They needed proper medical attention, which they did not receive. So 11 of them died while in jail, and we buried them. So they died and had. What would you say if justice has been delayed? It was denied. They were never had. The king was put under house arrest. Even the few people who were given bail were denied access to their relatives. They would not be allowed to go to Kasese. The king, for example, was put under house arrest for all those six years. And then eventually they say, we are setting you free, but you have to sign some papers. Amnesty. You sign for amnesty. What does that mean? You know, government doesn't want people to say, when you tell the king to sign for amnesty, you have told him to plead guilty. 
But what do you expect of someone who has stayed under house incarceration for seven years? He's not allowed to visit, even to the extent of denying him to bury his own mother. His mother died. He asked the government, would you allow me to go to Kasese and Vundibujo to bury my mother? Because among the areas he was denied not to attend, Kasese was one of them. He was only allowed to move within the districts of Kase, Kampala, actually only around Kampala, Uganda, maybe Jinja, because he used to go to Jinja for, for court. But he was even denied to go and bury his mother. For all those years, he was receiving guests who were only authorized by government. At some point, he would receive guests that he has not invited. But they say, we are here to see you. We are telling you to soften your heart and, and talk to the president. Many of the royal guards who were in jail, the king was just asked to speak to them via Zoom to tell them, guys, just sign the papers. One of them said, me, I'm an educated man. Is that Prime Minister the Tembo? Pri yes, Tembo Kitumbele said, I can't just sign amnesty papers when I know what it means by amnesty. I did not kill anybody. I did not rob. I did not plan any treason against the government. And he said, by the way, surprisingly, I, 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 I subs he, before he became a, a premier in the, in the kingdom, he subscribed to the NRM party. So he said, how would I have betrayed my own, the party that I believe in? He said, I did not commit treason, and so I can't sign those papers. He did not sign. And he says, I just want government to provide evidence against me. Up to now, government has never gotten any sufficient evidence against the temple. We are not calling them to cook up the evidence because we know it is not there. You can't say my king is a, a robber. Those were one of the charges against him that he robbed. The killing they refer to in that court is a killing where 200 people, over 200 people, held one gun because the government says they have a gun which killed a police officer in Chidodo. How can 200 people hold one gun to go and kill one police officer? Because that is the robbery that is highlighted in the case. Over 200 people held a gun to go and kill a police officer in Chidodo. The robbery they are talking about, that there is a, a mattress which was stolen from a health center by the royal guards commanded by the king. A mattress. They accuse them of robbing some file at, at Chabarungera sub-county. A file in the sub-county headquarters. Whatever was in that file, nobody knows. So you are looking at a cultural leader and you even demean him to that level of referring to him as a robber, and a petty robber, by the way, because by the time you go to rob a file, you go to rob a mattress, you are just a petty robber, a king. No, 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 no. That was really going beyond the expectation of a government, or what's being called a government. Yeah, I hear you, ma'am. In the report that was presented to the ICC and the copy that you received, the ICC concluded that there were crimes of murder that were committed. Yes. And they mentioned that there was indiscriminate and disproportionate, disproportionate force, force that use. was used against the, the people in the yes. palace. And, and the people were around there had gunshots yes. and some hats were set ablaze on yes. that day. Yes. And you also had an opportunity of getting to Kasese because you already in yes. transit on that day. What do you recollect? What I can say is that, well, indeed there were people killed. Government, our government is accused of murdering its own people. So people like Peter Elweru, who got promotion after promotion after killing people, Really, if this government was not doing, violating rights with impunity, a red would be in jail now. Because he's the one who commanded the killing of those people. And if the ICC is saying, yes, the disproportionate force was used, even to us, the people, we said that was too much force, even if they were aware that these people were committing treason against government, how many rebels is Museven sitting with on table even right now? Isn't he with the Moses Ali's who were rebels? 
isn't he with the Echuerus, who were Arab boys? Would the Renzururu rebels be the only ones that he would sit with to negotiate and see how they talk peace? Had he really exhausted all peaceful ways of resolving conflicts before the attack? I don't remember as a leader from Renzururu Kingdom and as a member of parliament to that, having been called in a meeting, maybe mediated by the government of Uganda, between the cultural institution and government, I don't remember. So when Elweru says that we, the leaders, knew and we should be held liable, he should point at a meeting where we sat as leaders talking about those issues. He actually says that you, at the time, you're the leader of opposition. Yes, I was. And other MPs should be held personally accountable that is for what happened in Kasesa. And he, this is why he says so. He says that you saw all this build up and you did nothing about it. And therefore, you should be held accountable. And he demanded for your resignation at the time. I think uh, there is nobody who could have taken him serious after he himself could not resign for killing innocent civilians, he didn't resign. Two, we did nothing. We didn't kill anyone. How could we have resigned? In fact, the first meeting that we had been called for was that one of a Sunday. And he should have said we invited these leaders and they never came. But they never even waited for us to be in that meeting and to see who was right and who was wrong because in that meeting possibly we would have then been told whether our king had issues for us as leaders we went to the king and spoke to him after we saw what happened at the coronation ceremony we said what is the problem well everybody was in agreement that president M7 was still annoyed with the cultural institution because of the grades he got in kasese and that was clear because every leader who lost, was attributing it to the cultural leader not supporting the president. And yet for us, we didn't see the cultural leader coming out to support. The only reason is that he remained silent and he did not speak for either President Museveni or for the opposition. So for them, they expected him to stand up and speak for the NRM. Possibly say the leaders of the NRM are the ones that should be voted for like he did in uh, 2011. In 2011, I think he was very categorical. He said to the people of Kasesa, I think we need to thank President M7 for recognizing our cultural institution. I remember personally going to him and saying, Your Majesty, we have just passed the law restraining cultural leaders from participating in partisan politics. You are breaking the law as a Kosandi citizen. And I remember the current minister, the Honorable Godfrey Kavianga saying, those people disrespected the king. How do you go to tell the king that he has made a mistake? I said, well, me, I just went to inform him of the provision of the law because I am his representative, even when he's my king, but at least I represent his interests in parliament. And so I just wanted him to know that there is that law. At that time, the NRM enjoyed the support of the king and there was no problem. While they did not get it 100%, I mean the voters did not give them 100%, but now in 2016, the king remained silent. He didn't support either the opposition nor the NRM. And for them, they thought his silence meant that he had a relationship with the opposition. Yeah. Don't so for us, we still believe that the attack was politically motivated and it was, I think, an attack on the tribe. Because if it was for people who were just uh, people committing treason against the, 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 the president, the sitting president, he has all these institutions on the ground. There is the DPC, there is the RDC. There is the DISO. We have the PISOs and GISOs. I think we even have VISOs. Really, in Uganda, would you put a recruiting center in the middle of town 
And by the way, next to the cultural institution is the, D the Diso's whole house. So how do you recruit rebels in the compound of the Diso? There are three house, two houses in the middle from the cultural institution. There is one house, second, the third was the Diso's house. What did the Diso do? Honorable Winikiza, it's eight years on. Has there been justice for the over 130 people There has never been justice of the over 150 people who were killed. And actually to us, when we went to the ICC, we were seeking justice for the dead who could not speak for themselves. Because we knew that at least the ones who had been arrested, those ones who would meet their own fate in court, we assisted by ensuring they had lawyers but the ones who were dead, who would speak for them? It's the reason we went to the ICC, to see whether the ICC could hold some people culpable. And we had people whom we had taken there. We, take, we took General Yoweri Kaguta Museveni as the commander in chief of the armed forces. We took there then Brigadier, General, Brigadier Peter Erueru who later became Lieutenant General, and then eventually he was made a full general. And all these he rode on the bodies of the people, on the blood of the Bakonzo people that he's, he poured in the cultural institution. It will never leave him the same, that blood that he commanded pouring. Do you feel a sense of Resignation. I mean, you tried your best. We tried our best as leaders, but as a people, we shall never remain the same. The sky is too big. The families that were left, you can't believe it. Uh, some children left school. It's just a wasted generation. Children left school. Others went into early marriage. Some women were kicked out of their husbands' homes by the relatives of the husbands. Even those who were in jail after the seven years, by the time they came back, their land had been grabbed. The setup is no longer the same Solomon. And so you can't expect our people to remain the same. Even after they brought them, do you know what they did? They gave them the first batch that came towards elections. They were given 100,000, go and start life with 100,000. That was after six years in jail. Now the batch that came finally, they gave them 200,000, go and start life. And we are told to stop talking about opposition politics, we are still monitoring you. So even when they are out of prison, they are still living in some cocoons of prisons. They are not allowed to interact with specific types of people. They are not allowed to participate in opposition politics. You can only survive if you are participating in the NRM politics. There is nothing that has been done to repair their lives. Remember these people were beaten. Some of them are still nursing injuries and they still come to us. We have medical bills to meet. We have medical checkups to do. Eight we, years later. Yes, eight years later. They are those who have become lame out of this. So the, the situation has never remained the same. Consider these ones who died in prison. They are loved ones who don't receive dead bodies. And even when they were in prison, the economic hardships that their families went through Remember, they moved them from Kasese, took them to Jinja, and every week they would appear in court. Their families would come thinking maybe their people were going to be released on, on bail. For someone to move from Kasese to Jinja, we were estimating 100,000 that an individual would spend to come and check on a loved one before they even think of what do I carry for them. Because yes. transport alone by that time was... 30,000 coming, 30,000 going, that is 60. Then you put on the 10, 10 from Kampala to Jinja, that is 80. Then you put on some Kalanj. It was 100,000 net 
that a person was spending. And remember, these are 200 people. So over 200 Ugandans were commuting from Kaseso on a weekly to come and check on their people. How much money were these people spending in transport? And that is if they have not slept around Kampala. So talk about the incomes of those households. They were heavily depleted to the extent that some of them decided to get their children out of school. Yeah. So do you think these children who left school because of that will pray for Eruero to continue enjoying his life the way he does? General Eruero says in his words he acted professionally. Yeah, if, if soldiers are taught to kill, then indeed he acted professionally. If that is what it means by being a professional army, to kill civilians whom you are supposed to protect and defend, then I give up. And I would not really encourage my son to become, or my daughter to become then a soldier. But I know that the soldiers are supposed to save lives. As a daughter of Kasese, what would be your call? To government my call to government would especially be, regarding to the lives that were lost back in I, I i would say that well i know they have done everything with impunity to the extent that they have forced people to even plead guilty because by signing the, the amnesty documents is that they are saying we are guilty you you torture people you kill them and then eventually you tell them to say we are guilty for the atrocities that you committed against us. That's a high level dehumanization that I have seen. We still believe that the perpetrators can be put to book, just like the ICC did propose, even when I don't entirely agree with their uh, ruling. The conclusion somehow brings in some examples of saying they can hold the perpetrators accountable. But remember, the other reason why we went to the ICC was that we knew that President Museveni wouldn't have held himself accountable. And so we thought a different person would be capable of holding him accountable. It is President Museveni who, come, who, who, who sanctioned the whole killing. And then he used the Peter Weru. Asmani Mugenyi supervised on behalf of the police. Those are the three people that we took to the ICC. So how do you say that cases of murder were committed and therefore in the, the, the local mechanisms should be used to address the, the matter? How does Museveni use the local mechanisms against himself? Eight years later, people think, do not scratch healing wounds. The, the wounds have never healed because no medication has been put on those wounds. Nobody has attended to the wounds. You people, there is a lot that is happening. You may see the people silent, but their hearts are not silent. Their lives are never the same. There has never been any mechanism that is addressing the suffering that people have gone through. So how do we say we should not scratch the wounds? The, 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 the wounds are still fresh. They are not really dry. Because the people who are arrested. They go to prison for seven years. You don't prefer any charges against them. And they know that they are really innocent. You have not even taken them through any court process. You force them to sign papers that purport to mean that they are guilty. Well, to them, they may say, let's just sign so that we can have some breathing space. That could have been the motivation. But in a sense, they are not free. See what the amnesty law says. Those people may not be allowed to even occupy any seat within some period because they have pleaded guilty to some cases. Now, we know that President Museveni just wanted to get it off himself. Should anybody again take him to the ISIS, and that's why he was hurrying, because uh, the Honorable Chagulani was also collecting signatures to go to the ICC. Dr. Besige was also collecting signatures to beef up the case that we had taken. So he had to hurry. He was chasing time. He had to hurry to make these people sign for amnesty. So that should he be summoned 
then he can wave the amnesty papers and say, you know, these people pleaded guilty. They even asked for amnesty. Did they go through the full process of court? How do you tie me and you say, I have asked for pardon genuinely? The king had been under house arrest for those six years. People are arrested for over six years. They just see this as a relief to tell them, sign these papers, you will be set free, and your cases will be put aside. What do you expect people whose arms and legs are tied to, to do? If there is anything that can save them, they can do it as long as it's not leading to their death. Yeah. So really, I will say that the government failed on its part to protect the people of Kasese. You can still say that they don't care about us, because even recently, while we have a full army, on the borders of Congo and Uganda. Our people were attacked and the school was attacked by rebels, the ones they wanted to call ADF rebels, killed students. And yet all the machinery of government is on the border. So to us as a people, we sit back and ask ourselves, are we really a part of this government? Does President Museveni think that he owes the Bakonzo a duty of care? Or he thinks we are just an inconvenience in his life or in his leadership? So I still want to believe that someday they will answer for their actions. The Ereros may hide under President Museveni's government, but they will not hide forever because President Museveni is immortal. He's not immortal. And, and that's where I was going to come as we conclude. The Honorable Winnie Kiza, you want to appreciate that Kasese and that region is a bit volatile. Yeah. With, you know, the border with Congo, the ADF, and therefore the security system needs to be on high alert yeah. for anything that could likely yeah. come. Do you want to appreciate that? We have all appreciated that. And sometimes that's why some of us were high on the, okay, supported highly the transitional justice policy thinking that they were going to operationalize it and implement it very fast because we know that the battles of the people of Renzori started, started as far back as the colonial times. By the time Renzoruru Kingdom, the, the Renzoruru movement started, it was a movement that fought the Toro Kingdom, but at the same time fighting the colonial masters. What people should know is that uh, at that time when the Banyarwenzururu were fighting with the Toro for recognition and the Toro kingdom refused to recognize them, said you are all our subjects, but they said, okay, at least in your constitution, say that you have Bakonzo and Devamba. And the Toro kingdom said, no, we are not going to recognize you as Bakonzo and we are not going to recognize you as Bamba. Actually, the constitution is talking about the Batoro. This one said, but we are not Batoro. So the old men walked out of the Rukurato of Toro. Now, when they walked out of the Rukurato of Toro, central government came in to assist the Toro kingdom to fight the Bakonzo. So the central government that should have protected also the Bakonzo, as they were trying to ask for recognition, also fought the, king, the, the, the Bakonzo. That is why you hear people saying that the Bakonzo asked for a separate state. At that time, the elders said, if the government that is supposed to defend us cannot defend us, then we would rather seek for our own state. And I think people have carried that up to now, and it is true. Our elders felt marginalized to the extent that they had a petition they took to the African Union. The old men who were carrying a petition to the African Union were arrested in Rwanda. It is a story that people should know. They were arrested in Rwanda. They had their grievances against the government at that time. So it has been an area that is really so volatile. And we thought that a mechanism that would touch the hearts and souls of the people would be appropriate to address the Rwenzori question. We have talked about this again and again. Nobody wants to listen. That's why we keep asking, are we part of Museveni's agenda? Honorable Inikiza, thank you so much for speaking to us. Welcome. It's eight years on, and 
according to the Honorable Winnie Kiza, there's not been any justice for the over 100 plus people who were killed back in 2016. And as we get through November, it's only fair that we bring back this discussion. I'm Solomon Serwanja, and this is The Hard Questions. Thank you.